Thanks, Richard. Well, I hope I don't disappoint after all that. Um, disappoint you and uh, oh, there's a glass of water, but that's very good. So if I <clears throat> run out of breath, I can liquefy myself. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to put that there. That's the text just in case we need to refer to it. Um, so this morning I, I'm going to talk on what I call two ways of seeing, two different ways of seeing. Uh, based on Julian of Norwich's parable of a lord and a servant. Um, in her long text, uh, A Revelation of Love, um, she wrote two texts, a short text. It's thought fairly shortly after her original experiences, her, her revelations or showings, uh, where she believed that God, um, as it were, uh, challengingly presented her with uh, a, a range of insights, uh, which kind of uh, were, 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 were challenging because they didn't quite correspond, as we shall see, uh, with what she, as a, a sort of traditional uh, medieval Christian, uh, had been told by Holy Church, particularly about sin uh, and about uh, God as God as an angry God who wishes to judge us for our sinfulness. Anyway, in her long text, which was about took about 20 years of further reflection before she was able to write it. Um, um, chapter 51, which is the parable of the Lord and the servant, is in my judgment, uh, the key to her theological insights and her teachings, what, uh, as Richard said, uh, she felt that she had been asked or mandated by God to pass on to her, even Christian, her fellow Christians. Um, She's actually more concerned about that, about what she's been asked to pass on, than she is about her visions. Uh, she doesn't spend a lot of time uh, sort of saying, look, how amazing I am, or how amazing it was that I had all these experiences. Anyway, the chapter, chapter 51, contains a parable of a lord and a servant, uh, and reflects upon this, as I say, in challenging ways. For Julian, um, the parable, um, is God's answer to her ongoing anxiety um, uh, about how to relate her feelings of personal sinfulness to her growing sense of God's lack of blame and judgment. In chapter 45, so a few chapters earlier, uh, Julian outlines her problem of how to reconcile what she calls the judgment of Holy Church, that sinners sometimes deserve blame and wrath. Um, with the fact that I could not see these two in God. To all this, she says, I never had any other answer than a wonderful example of a Lord and a servant, as I shall tell later. By example, uh, Julian means uh, what, what the medievals referred to as an, an exemplum. That's to say a rhetorical device used by preachers to illustrate their message and to edify persuade and then motivate uh, the congregation, the listeners. Julian's parable employs the imagery of lordship and service. This echoes important social values in Julian's changing times. Earlier on in her chapter seven, her bodily vision of the opious bleeding of the head of Jesus on the cross gave her strength through her realization that God while our Lord is so familiar and so courteous, as she puts it. Julian reflects that the greatest gift of a Lord that a Lord can offer to a servant is to be familiar. I quote, see what greater honor and joy uh, could this noble Lord give me than to demonstrate to me who am so little this wonderful familiarity. This is more significant uh, than being given material benefits by uh, your employer. Again, in chapter 14, Julian's, quote, understanding was lifted up into heaven. And there she sees God as Lord in his own house, as she puts it. He doesn't emphasize rank, but hosts a splendid banquet for all his friends. The themes of familiarity and courtesy to servants were becoming aspects of Julian's surrounding social culture at her time. Courtesy, a word used by Julian in relation to God and to the Lord in the parable, 
uh, connects with courtliness. That's to say a new code of good manners that was emerging in city life, for example, here in Norwich. This went beyond politeness and involved respect, kindness, and consideration for servants. The exploitation of servants was slowly being replaced by a culture of care. Conversely, the ideal of servants in their relationship with the Lord was attachment and love, shown appropriately according to social status. Now the parable. It seems that the narrative of the Lord and the servant was part of Julian's original visions, but perplexed her so much that she didn't include it in her earlier short text. In chapter 32 of the long text, uh, Julian struggles to hold on to God's promise that every kind of thing will be well. This contrasts with her perception that, quote, there are many deeds which in our eyes are so evilly done and lead to such great harm that it seems to us impossible that any good result could ever come from them. In chapter 50, that's the chapter before the parable, Julian returns to the subject of her continual struggle to balance her awareness of sin with her inward understanding that God imputes no blame to humankind. Chapter 50, that's the, the, the one before, as I say, ends with her anguished cry, Oh, Lord Jesus, King of bliss, how shall I be comforted? Who will tell me and teach me what I need to know if I cannot at this time see it in you? Then at the beginning of chapter 51, Julian says she was answered very mysteriously, in her words, by a wondrous example of a Lord who has a servant. God also gave me sight for the understanding of them both. Julian summarizes uh, three stages of her understanding and presumably of composing a final text, the one that we have now. And therefore, she says, I must now tell of three attributes through which I have been somewhat consoled. The word attributes, uh, that's the word that's used in the, uh, the translation called showings uh, by Edward College and, and James Walsh, who uh, many, many years ago, uh, when I worked with him, introduced me to Julian. I'd never heard of her before. Um, the word attributes translates Middle English three properties, that is, ways of learning and knowing. The first attribute is the foundational teaching received through Julian's original vision. The second is the inward instruction that Julian believes she received afterwards. Finally, there is a to see as a whole the insight revealed in the parable from beginning to end, she says. Now, Julian's parable tells a story in which every detail of the characters, their way of looking, their appearance, has a specific meaning. The two central characters are a lord and a servant. The lord, she says, sits in rest and in peace, while the servant stands respectfully before him ready to do his will. Now the parable proceeds with the Lord sending his servant off to do an errand. And the loving servant rushes off, but in his haste, falls into a ditch, a dell, she calls it, and is seriously hurt. However, the worst damage that Julian sees is that the servant could not look up from the ditch into which he'd fallen to see his loving Lord who stood close by and therefore there was a failing of comfort, as she puts it. Instead, the servant was full, feeble, and unwise. That is to say, weak and stupid, in her words, because he could only focus on how badly he felt. One, for having failed, and two, because he was hurt. This resulted in seven great pains, which are described in both physical and psychological terms. These were severe bruising, clumsiness of his body, weakness caused by these two, being blinded in his reason and perplexed in his mind so that he almost forgot his own love. The fact that he couldn't rise out of the ditch, the pain of lying alone with no apparent help at hand, and finally, that the ditch was narrow and comfortless. <laughs> 
Interestingly, the uh, medieval theologian Anselm of Canterbury also used the image of a servant and a ditch in his work, Quo Deus Homo, Why uh, God Became Man. However, in Anselm, the servant's fall is an act of disobedience that makes him incapable of performing his tasks. The tone is one of moral, moral culpability and guilt. Now, Julian takes a completely different stance, as you know, I'm sure, from reading chapter 51. The servants fall into the ditch results from an excessive desire to please his Lord. In that sense, Julian and Anselm uh, also disagree about how they interpret Adam's fall as expressed in the book of Genesis, chapter three, and its implication for humanity's status before God. Julian couldn't detect any fault in the servant, nor did the Lord impute any kind of blame. Although he was deeply wounded, in spirit, she says, the servant remained fundamentally good. As Julian notes, during all this time, the loving Lord looks on the servant tenderly, rather than with judgment. The way the Lord looks has two dimensions. Outwardly, it's with compassion and pity. The deeper level led Julian to see how the Lord rejoices over the noble healing to which he will bring the servant. The Lord puts the servant's injuries in the context of his loving service and asks rhetorically uh, whether it's not reasonable that he should reward the servant for his fright and fear as he fell in the ditch. What Julian refers to as an inward spiritual revelation of the Lord's meaning led her to understand that the servant's eternal reward would be above what he would have been if he had not fallen. Julian remains uncertain about how to interpret what she understands to have been revealed to her as the answer to her own struggles and uncertainties about sin and blame. A full appreciation of the parable and its meaning was not immediately clear. And as she notes in chapter 51, I quote, for 20 years after the time of the revelation, except for three months, I received an inward instruction. And it was this, you ought to take heed uh, to all the attributes divine and human, which were revealed in the example, in the example. Uh, though this may seem to you mysterious and ambiguous. In this instruction, Julian is granted an understanding that's not purely intellectual, but is a deep spiritual insight that involves accepting what she's been shown on all its levels. Thus, Julian is led to a wholly new per perception about God, about human identity, and about our eternal union with God. It seems that as a result of this new insight, uh, Julian not only inserted the parable into her long text when she got around to writing it 20 years after the experiences, but may also have revised earlier chapters and also uh, have been led to reflect on the famous image of the motherhood of Jesus and overall the motherhood of God in the chapters that follow on from the parable. Now the teaching of the parable. God's new inward instruction to Julian leads her to understand the full implications of the parable. She comes to see that the Lord is actually God and that the servant, first instance is Adam. She also came to see that in this one symbolic person and his fall is included how God regards all humankind and their failings. I quote, for in the sight of God, all men, which uses masculine version, are one man and one man is all men. Her critical insight is that while the servant was injured in his powers, his will, parallel to the godly will she expresses in chapter 37, is preserved God's sight. Because of his injury, the servant was prevented from knowing this will, his own will. The implication is that human sinfulness, um, our capacity to fall into ditches, as it were, is its own punishment. The punishment consists of our pain at apparent separation from God and also self-loathing. Quote, and then I saw that only pain blames and punishes, and our courteous Lord comforts and succors 
and always he is kindly disposed to the soul, loving and longing to bring us to his bliss. Then Julian sees the Lord sitting on the ground, alone in the barren wilderness, rather than sitting on a throne. It eventually becomes clear as Julia's cha Julian's chapter unfolds that this image signifies that God seeks no alternative dwelling place other than the human soul, created to be God's own city and dwelling. Indeed, Julian comes to see that the human soul is the most blessed, in her view, the most blessed and pleasing of all God's works. And there, sitting upon the ground, God waits, quote, until the time when by his grace, his beloved son had brought back his city into its noble place of beauty by his hard labor. Later in chapter 51, when the son has restored the city of the human soul to its true beauty, the Lord once again gets up and sits down, but now in his noblest seat, not on the ground. Julian initially sees the servant, as I say, as Adam, and in Adam, all humanity, wearing laborer's clothing, interesting, and wishing to do the one thing would pay honor to the Lord. This was to obtain a treasure in the earth, as she puts it, which the Lord loved. Julian wonders what this is, and is led to understand that, quote, it is a food which is delicious and pleasing to the Lord. Consequently, the servant was, quote, to do the greatest labor and the hardest work there is. This is to be a gardener, digging, planting, and making streams to run. Then the servant was to bring the fruit of this labor to the Lord and serve him. In a sense, the Lord has everything apart from the treasure in the earth. This treasure was founded in the Lord, but would only be really to his honor when the servant, that's humankind, had cultivated it and then brought it to him. Thereafter, Julian comes to understand that the servant also represents the son of God. So when Adam, humankind, fell, God's son also fell. And I quote, because of the true union, which was made in heaven, God's son could not be separated from Adam. For by Adam, I understand all mankind. Adam fell from life to death into the valley of the wretched world, and after that into hell. God's son fell with Adam into the valley of the womb of the maiden, who was the fairest daughter of Adam. And that was to excuse Adam from blame in heaven and on earth. Critical key to Julian's image, insight, and teaching is that, quote, in all this, our good Lord showed his own son and Adam uh, to be only one man. In Julian, it's quite clear that God is not angry or dishonored, nor does God assign blame to humankind. This is reinforced by her image of the Lord sitting patiently on the ground in the wilderness. The only blame is our own self-blame, caused by a deep sense of failure. Thus, in Julian's narrative, the servant in the ditch can only feel pain and failure because he is self-preoccupied and therefore unable to see that the Lord is looking upon him with pity. Blame is part of our own self-preoccupation and destructive self-image, according to Julian. This prevents us from seeing ourselves truly or from seeing God truly. In short, I'm a failure, I'm guilty, I'm worthless. And thus, when Julian says, and so has our good Lord Jesus taken upon him all our blame, this is not the blame that God lays upon us. It is the unproductive sense of guilt that we lay upon ourselves and which makes us feel unlovable in the sight of God. Thus, the son, quote, taking upon him all our blame is the redemption of our blinded sight and the healing of our own confusions that stand between us and God's unending love. In that sense, redemption, the Christian doctrine of redemption, is an act of healing and compassion 
rather than God as judge, showing clemency uh, to sinful humanity. Interestingly, the double understanding of the servant in Julian's parable has the son of God uh, wear Adam's tunic and take on all our charge, that is, all humanity's responsibility as the gardener of the earth. In medieval society, clothing was not merely a practical matter, but differentiated each social class. So clothing was a form of uniform. In reference to the Lord sitting on the ground in the wilderness, Julian says that his clothing was wide and ample and very handsome, as befits a Lord. She also notes that the color of the Lord's clothing was azure blue. Now, culturally uh, and socially, this may reflect the fact that by Julian's time, blue, the color blue, had become the dominant color of the clothes of the rich. Both in clothing and in art, blue was used increasingly as a noble color. In addition, the appearance of blue in images of the Virgin Mary made it an image of faithfulness and of what is truly spiritual. Consequently, the blue clothing of the Lord sitting on the ground in the wilderness symbolized his faithfulness to humanity and his humility. The image of clothing is used creatively in the parable. The son wearing Adam's tunic becomes the image of the son of God taking on our human flesh and being permitted to, in her words, suffer all man's pain. By his tunic, being ready to go to rags and to tear, she says, is understood the rods and the scourges, the thorns and the nails, the pulling and the dragging and the tearing of his tender flesh, of which I had seen a part in the vision. This refers back to Julian's original vision of Jesus suffering on the cross when she was seriously ill. In fact, she thought she was dying. Uh, there is also a graphic parallel between the son's suffering on the cross and the original narrative of the servant trapped in the ditch. And by the tossing about and writhing, the groaning and the moaning is understood that he could never with almighty power rise from the time that he fell into the maiden's womb until his body was slain and dead and he had yielded his soul into the father's hand with all mankind for whom he had been sent. Then in the resurrection, Adam's old tunic, in her words, was made lovely. At the end of the chapter, as already noted, the Lord no longer sits in the wilderness on the ground, but, but on a noble seat on the throne, in other words. The servant as son of God now stands immediately before the father, not as a servant, pitifully clothed, but, quote, richly clothed in joyful amplitude with a rich crown upon his head. Now, the rich crown upon his head was humanity. We are his crown, she says. Subsequently, the son does not stand to the left of the father as if he were a common servant, but sits at the father's right hand. So he both sits and he's at the father's right hand in endless rest and peace. By comprehending in the image of the servant both Adam, humankind, and the son of God, Julian understands not simply that the fall and redemption are a single event in God's sight, but that the creation and redemption of humanity are a simultaneous process. The first implies and contains the second. By being created, we are, as it were, already redeemed. As I've already noted, the parable is presented as God's answer to Julian's anxieties about her experience of daily sinfulness, yet her growing sense of God's lack of blame. In many respects, this chapter, 51, is pivotal to Julian's uh, teaching that she sought to pass on to her fellow Christians. She believed she'd be mandated to pass on. The focus of the parable is a major realignment of Julian's beliefs that God is lover rather than angry judge. This shapes a radical theology of sin and salvation. Now directly onto the two ways of seeing, referring to the title that I gave this lecture, Julian comes to understand that there are two ways of seeing reality. In her words, in my sight and in God's sight. 
As she suggests in earlier chapter 10, referring to her vision of Christ's passion, her seeing is necessarily incomplete. So I saw him, that's God, and sought him, and I had him, and lacked him. And this is and should be our ordinary undertaking in this life as I see it. Now, the key feature of the parable is that the fallen servant, like all fallen humanity, sees neither his loving Lord, quote, nor does he truly see what he himself is in the sight of his loving Lord. Indeed, as Julian suggests in the next chapter, chapter 52, God sees one way and man sees another way. That's why the deep implications of this parable were initially unclear to Julian. Julian needed to be shown the reality for, as in God's sight. The notion of beholding is a recurring theme in Julian. In her limited human way, uh, Julian initially sees the narrative of the parable and struggles to understand. 20 or so years later, Julian receives uh, inward instructions, as she put it, um, which leads her on to the critical level of beholding, that is, a spiritual vision. This doesn't merely refer to the depth of awareness, but also to the challenging nature of God's inward spiritual revelation. Thus, what becomes her chapter 51 parable contains theological insights that go uh, way beyond Julian's previous capacity to reach through purely intellectual or contemplative reflections. People we refer to as mystics uh, seek to express what they've come to see inwardly about God. In quite singular ways, Julian seeks to articulate from her experience not only something of what God is, but also something of how God sees. Therefore, Julian offers a radically alternative vision of creation, including human existence. Julian was shown, albeit momentarily, the world seen through God's eyes, as she puts it. Julian is also led uh, to view human nature through God's eyes. This results in two striking insights. First, there is neither blame nor anger in God. Both, as she puts it, and that's in chapters 45 to 49. And secondly, related to it, Sin, as she puts it in chapter 11, sin is no deed. In seeing God in everything, also in chapter 11, Julian also sees all things in God. And therefore, in all this, sin was not shown to me. Later, as she considers how sin hinders her longing for God in chapter 27, She's taught that she could not see sin as she contemplated the passion because, quote, it has no kind of substance, no share in being, nor can it be recognized except by the pain caused by it. Sin is the cause both of human pain and of Jesus's passion, and yet sin is also, in her words, Middle English word, behovely, that is, opportune. Because, as Julian is led to see, our sinfulness enables us to experience more profoundly the depth of God's love for us. In the end, chapter 51 underlines that God does not see sin, but only the bliss that will ultimately be ours. In God's vision, this is the ultimate truth. Thus, Julian, in her perception of God's way of seeing, as opposed to our way of seeing, cannot see sin even though she experiences its effects in her life and in the surrounding world. After all, she existed at a time of a major international war between England and France, plague, uh, uh, revolution, and all the rest of it. This is not to deny the reality of human sin. However, it does suggest that sin does not dominate God's essential relationship with us. Julian expresses this as a paradox at the end of chapter 34. She says, when I saw that God does everything which is done, I did not see sin. And then I saw that all is well. But when God did show me uh, about sin, then he said, all will be well. These assertions are based on God's 
endless, great endless love, she says. God is that goodness which cannot be angry, for God is nothing but goodness. That's in her chapter 50, uh, 46, sorry. However, as the parable of the Lord and the servant uh, makes clear, it all depends on a difference, two different ways of seeing. The parable is really a response to Julian's questions and concerns about sin and why she can't see sin when she contemplates reality in God. God looks on human beings and their failings with compassion and love and not with blame. So in the parable, Julian is led to understand that essentially God sees humanity in the light of his son. Quote, when Adam fell, God's son fell. Because of the true union which was made in heaven, God's son could not be separated from Adam. For by Adam, I understand all mankind, as she says. Julian finally understands the parable when she begins to see matters from God's perspective. From this standpoint, the stories of Adam, fall, and of Christ, God's incarnation, are somehow the same. The moment of Adam's fall becomes the moment of salvation as well. The parable is an exposition of the history of salvation from God's viewpoint. God looks upon us as we are in Christ and sees us as healed and glorified. That is how God sees, uh, and God sees the fallen servant in the ditch, and that contrasts radically with the servant's own experience of his pain and failure. In the light of eternity, we are ever in union with God and always have been. To quote from chapter 54, so after the parable, and for the great endless love that God has for all mankind, he makes no distinction in love between the blessed soul of Christ and the least soul that will be saved. In her 16th revelation, uh, on chapter 68, uh, Julian is led from her contemplation of the Lord's realm to seek where the Lord dwells. I quote, And then our good Lord opened my spiritual eye and showed me my soul in the midst of my heart. I saw the soul as wide as if it were an endless citadel, and also as if it were a blessed kingdom and the state which I saw in it, I understood that it's a fine city. And in the midst of that city sits our Lord Jesus, true God and true man. Julian's theology of human nature is complex and depends on understanding two dimensions, which she calls substance and sensuality. She develops that throughout chapters 54 to 59, if you want to follow that sometime. Now, these are not easy to define as the words have a number of implications. However, one way is to describe substance, not simply as a dimension of ourselves that by nature is irrevocably united to God and cannot be otherwise. It's also the self that God sees. In contrast, sensuality, as she calls it, stands for the contingent self that we see. Neither is exclusively true, but neither is untrue. While Julian's theology is not technical, it produced by a central image. And this central image is of Julian's original vision of the suffering Christ. Quote, his precious crowning with thorns, that is by Jesus' cross and passion. However, the original vision of Christ's passion reveals in a single moment, God as Trinity, the union of our humanity with God, and God's eternal and irrevocable love for us. In other words, this image contains the key to Julian's theology. Getting close to the end. A fundamental aspect of Julian's parable of the Lord and the servant is that there are four fallings which become one in her inner understanding. First, there's the surface narrative of a servant falling into a ditch. Then Julian comes to see that this represents Adam's fall as portrayed in the book of Genesis. Third, because Julian understands Adam to represent all humanity, the fall of Adam expresses the human situation, our human situation, of continually falling into sin. And finally, the fourth fall 
is that of the Son of God who falls into the womb of the maiden, that is to say, Mary. The Son of God enters into the human condition in what we call the incarnation, which becomes the medium of human redemption. Thus, beyond the four fallings, there is effectively a collapsing of time and historical sequence in the sight of human beings into a single eternal event as God sees it. Both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures portray a, a sequence narrative of creation, fall, salvation, and then an ultimate eternal destiny with God. Now, this sequence is shown in Julian, not to be an extended sequence, but a single moment. A single act and a single sight from God's perspective. And in this singleness, Julian's parable is shown at the end to be a narrative in which the son finally stands before God the Father, quote, with a rich and precious crown upon his head. And I've already mentioned, it was then revealed that we are his crown. Equally, the Lord, God as Father, no longer sits on the ground in the wilderness of fallen human existence. Rather, God the Father now sits, quote, in his rich and noblest seat in his own city, which we have, have come to understand from earlier in chapter 51 is the human soul. There can be no more striking image of God's courtesy and familiarity than to see the Lord and the King dwelling in the humblest state of the human soul. In Julian, God's home, God's place, God's heaven is within our souls understanding soul as the core of our human identity. Quote, for I saw very surely that our substance is in God, and I also saw that God is in our sensuality. For in the same instant and place in which our soul is made sensual, in that same instant place exists the city of God, ordained for him from without beginning. He comes into this city and will never depart from it. For God is never out of the human soul, in which he will dwell blessedly without end. That's in chapter 55. There's a tension uh, within Julian between the sense that God is in place uh, within created reality and the sense that her experience drew her beyond the limits of physical, time-bound and contingent space. Her place was to be an eternal, transcendent God. God was within her soul, was with her soul, and God was within the created world. Yet at the same time, God transcends the limits of material reality. Therefore, Christians must not believe that contingent reality satisfies human desires. This tension is perhaps most sharply expressed in uh, Julian's chapter five. The image of all created reality, quote, as something small, no bigger than a hazelnut, affirms God's creation in love and continual preservation of all things. Yet Julian goes on uh, in, the, in the same chapter to suggest that human beings should, quote, despise as nothing everything created. In the full context of Julian's teaching, the word despise is not, does not mean rejection of created reality, but an affirmation that human beings cannot ultimately be satisfied if they mistakenly think that the created order is the ultimate reality. In her first revelation, Julian indicated that she was astonished that God, God could be at home or familiar with us as simple creatures. She initially interpreted the great joy that she was given as a form of temporary spiritual consolation because, quote, our Lord Jesus wanted out of his courteous love to show me comfort before my temptations began. That was in chapter four. In a way, it was true that God desired to comfort her. However, uh, Julian uh, came to see uh, that this revelation also expresses a teaching about the humility of God in Christ. This insight echoes the sentiments of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians in chapter two regarding Christ Jesus, and I quote, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, 
and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death cross. Because God is, in that sense, humble, Julian's perfectly conventional desire to be immediately with God in heaven, as she says in chapter 19, was converted. This was a defining moment in the teaching she believed she'd received and then believed that she'd been mandated to communicate to us. Julian found that she didn't need to go to a, a heaven elsewhere to be with God, for God was already at home in the flesh of Jesus Christ and therefore with us in this material world and life. God's homeliness towards us is an extension of being at home. The divine love was revealed in Julian not simply as willing to suffer on the cross, but also as being at home in the human condition. So finally, the parable of the Lord and the servant <coughs> is in important ways central, in my view, to Julian's teaching. As the parable affirms, <coughs> God cannot see Adam, that's a humankind, except through the son's incarnation and passion. And that's why Julian is briefly shown reality as she believes God sees it. I did not see sin, she says in chapter 27. <coughs> Julian's key premise is that human nature in Adam is not independent of God's son. <coughs> uh, it's not independent of God's son, and <clears throat> that's to say that human nature. Uh, who united our substance and our sensuality. Hence, from all eternity, God has created humankind in God's Son to be God's crown. Now, the story of the Lord and the servant uh, in chapter 51 is presented as God's answer to Julian's anxieties and questions about her daily experience of sinfulness, yet her growing sense of God's lack of judgment and blame. As I've already mentioned, I believe that in a deep sense, this chapter is pivotal to Julian's uh, uh, theological quest and what she felt bound to teach us, uh, even Christian, her fellow Christians. The parable offers the key to Julian's sense of meaning about the true nature of God and the true nature of human existence that she's slowly and painfully come to understand and which she now seeks to pass on to us. <clears throat> As I've already indicated, in my view, the focus here is on a radical realignment <clears throat> of Julian's understanding of God as lover rather than angry judge of how creation and human identity are to be understood in God's sight and consequently the true nature of sin and salvation. Julian's whole theology of God later to include God as mother, and her positive theology of human nature, follow on, in my view, from this parable, and are dependent upon it. <laughs> Five minutes and a minute, sorry. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. Um, there's going to be an opportunity for 10 or 15 minutes questions. I'm going to um, start it off, but then I'm going to sit down in order to pick up some questions that may come from the audience. On okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, absolutely, fine, please. So a first question, please, arising <coughs> from um, what Philip brought to us. Father Luke. I can. <laughs> Not really a question, but um, sort of thought Luke. Um, I just take this opportunity of thanking Philip in his heartfelt thanks. Um, some years ago, uh, I'd already uh, published that four books, three four books, um, and then I went in fear and trembling to uh, Lambeth Palace, where Philip was one of the examiners. Um, I should have been a better faith because my 
simplify some of those problems as well. Those of you who work know they have a good idea about uh, how she is and how you might be too. Um, I was sitting outside the door in theatre in Germany, um, trying to you know, it wasn't a, a thesis, it wasn't a doctor, uh, dissertation on human, okay, but somebody called Henry now. Oh, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I went into the uh, exam room where Philip and Kelly Ford, who was very, very high in life. Um, and he, uh, Philip's first words were, now, we don't want you to do any more writing. Uh, there's no need for that, no need to do any more rewriting. So, um, we want to use this time together um, to prepare your thesis for publication. Just imagine you yourself looking at the doctor of three words, um, hearing the wonderful words. You don't want to do any rewrite. We want you to uh, use this time together, the three of us together, in order to um, get the book so that it is published. Um, I'm profoundly grateful to Philip because after that, yes. Uh, he led me to uh, yeah, the same last and long in the top. Um, I think about six books that um, they published in my theory. I think about all those creeds and the uh, and theory in general. Um, but three, three of those are one theory, including one that I think that you could have. So, Flip, my heartfelt thanks to you for leading me towards publication. Thank you. Very kind of you, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 So one and then two. One, yeah. Three, yeah. Have to practice to non duality. Non duality. Look at non duality. Yeah. See what you what you talking about is just non duality. None of you see. No, no, no. That's right. So in other words, uh, it goes against any belief that. Uh, our material self is basically unimportant and that only our inner spiritual self is important. You're saying in non-duality, I presume, that you, you know, there's no separation. There's no separation. Yeah. yeah. Also, <clears throat> so much, we trust our own sight. We trust our own sight. Um, so we love it all. It's all about us. You know, that, but it's like we don't trust that enough, but essentially that is non-dual seeing, isn't it? It's not seeing the separation. That's right. So I, I just think it, what you sort of outlined is just so modern, so uh, kind of like, and obviously it's in, I haven't really, I've read, I've read Revelation probably about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just loved it. Well, thank you. So, I'm trying to understand what you were talking about about the, the uh, different interpretation of the word despise and what you were talking about about the fact that the human experience as a limited structure. But um, I just kind of got a little tripped up there trying to take a little bit of the same time, so I don't know if you could um, just re uh, explain um, you know, the different Using the word despise. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I should have to quickly look at my notes because I've, I've mentioned so many different things. Um, uh, well, I think the point that I'm trying to, I was trying to make basically was the idea that God somehow despises our material lives, our material side is, is in Julian's view, completely wrong. Uh, uh, you know, it's not that, as it were, God says, you know, that the human body and our existence in historical time and place are basically, well, unfortunately, you've got to put up with that, but they're a waste of time. Frankly, <laughs> the most important thing is your, your inner spiritual selves, 
um, she basically goes against that. Um, uh, and I'm just trying to find where I actually use the word despise because it's a, uh, pardon me for, for being a bit slow here. Um, but, um, oh, it's... Well, I was just wanted to say it was very interesting when you were talking about the story of the Dittin and the end of Oscar Wilde and whether he was a very well-read, albeit very uh, uh, a heretical individual, <laughs> he uh, had that quote, we're all laying in the ditch, but some of us are looking out at the stars. Say that again. We're all, we're all laying in the ditch, but some of us are looking out at the stars. Right. Oh, that's, and yeah, good. I was wondering if that was related to this part of the ditch. If by that you mean that, uh, or he meant, uh, that um, basically, um, I mean, in, in, in her narrative, the servant in the ditch can't see anything else except the servant's own injured, damaged body. So whatever he's doing, he's not looking up at the stars. Uh, and he's unable, and he doesn't realize that the Lord has followed after him and is looking down upon him with pity. He can't see the Lord either because he's so self-preoccupied. Um, so looking up at the stars must be uh, pushing against self-preoccupation, yeah. trying to see into a beyond. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yes, yes. Yeah, um, I discovered Julian knowledge about the same time as Signature of Royal. Life. Oh, right. Oh, and well. um, it's a kind of force within form, I think, especially this parable. And what I'm struck with as you were describing it, is the similarity between being stuck in the ditch and how Ignatius describes desolation. Yes. And also the, the fact that the, the seven is acting out of desire and rushes off. So I think what, what I'm thinking is that the fall into desolation is inevitable, which is kind of what Ignatius says. I think the bit that's bugging me is that in terms of the sermon, um, Ignatius talks about trying to understand how we got to this point of desolation when we realise we're in desolation. And I think the bit that's sticking is in order to guard against it. So it seems to me that that paradox is like, yeah, there's no blame and we're going to fall into a ditch even when we're rushing in our desire to, to do God's will. It's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like Ignatius suggests, well, have a look at how did you fall into that ditch in order to better guard against it, I think is what Ignatius says. So he doesn't say you're not, you're not going to fall into it again, no. but it's, it's about the way I, I think, I, yeah, thank you. I mean, I think one of the, the, the things that, that always struck me about Ignatius's uh, spirituality and spiritual exercises is that. Um, there might be a tendency initially when you think of consolation and desolation that consolation is a nice feeling and desolation is a bad feeling uh, and that's it um, right? whereas i think with ignatius it's all about where these feelings lead you and if you want to tell the difference between a, a constructive feeling um, and a destructive feeling you know if you were to follow that feeling where would it take you would it lead you to deeper life? Or would it lead you to um, an even greater separation from God? So I think for, for Ignatius, desolation is not just feeling bad, but sometimes desolation um, actually may be an experience which is challenging you to see things differently. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, and um, I'm, also, I'm thinking about in terms of the seven, I can't see God. Mm. isn't able to see no. God. So I, I wasn't necessarily thinking of it as feeling bad, but also that. No, but I think I'm not to saying that I think a lot of people immediately interpret, oh, if I'm desolated, I must be feeling bad. Mm. You know, Ignatius doesn't mean that. No, no, he doesn't. But at the same time, he said in the can't see God. No. It's all wrapped up in whatever it is. Self-preoccupation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting, interesting parallel between uh, Ignatius and Julian. Um, I mean, they both come from very different backgrounds and very different experiences. They're both late medieval figures, if you like, in a way. Yeah. Uh, so they both come out of a very fractured world that's full of complications. Um, 
but you know, Ignatius comes from sort of an, an ennobled uh, Spanish, well, Basque, uh, Spanish Basque uh, background um, with all that that implies, um, a country that had been occupied by Islam for many, many years. So there are all sorts of tensions going on there. Um, Julian comes from a, uh, a, an English world uh, that is very, and I say English rather than British, um, very fractured by a civil war, uh, by uh, a so-called heresy, you know, the uh, uh, Lollard heresy. Uh, I, I put it in inverted commas because I think one might want to reinterpret that. Um, um, and also um, by the plague. I mean, the plague hit Norwich. Uh, <coughs> I think three times, I can't quite remember exactly, I think it's three times, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, Julian would have been very well aware of the plague because it was just around all the time. And, um, I mean, there are those who think, who think something to do with imagery that she uses in the text, that she may well have been married uh, and had a child, and she may well have lost the child in the plague because a lot of the most vulnerable people who died in the work were young children. But um, well then you say, what about her husband? Well, he could have died in the war with the French. There's all sorts of spec but it's all speculation. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if um, you talked a little bit about um, Julian breaking so remarkably in figures such as Anselm. And um, <laughs> yes. is she, do we have any evidence that she is aware of figures like Anselm? or theological schools? I think the short answer is to that is no. Um, you know, that, that there is, I mean, people over the years have speculated massively about what theology she must have read and uh, who must have been her theological influences and this, that, and the other. But if you actually stick with what we know about her, um, and there's not a lot that we know. I mean, all we know is her texts, the short text, the long text. Uh, she's mentioned, I think it's in the three wills uh, who leave her money. Uh, as it was quite common to leave um, anchor, anchor, anchorites and anchoresses uh, money to, uh, um, as it were, help them sustain their lives and all the rest of it. But beyond that, um, uh, we know very little about her. So it's pure speculation. I think my, my own personal view is I think it's unlikely that she had you know, read theology. Um, she talks about herself as an unlettered creature, but I, I don't think that means she was illiterate. Unlike Marjorie Kemp, who I think were, most scholars admit were, was illiterate, uh, because that was fairly common. Um, because on the whole, uh, sadly, in those days, women were not educated by their parents. Um, they were expected to marry and make children. That was your job. Um, um, Whereas I think there's a general perception is that Julian was literate in that sense. So unlettered doesn't mean that. I, I think it may, it, it could involve several things, but one of the things I think it might mean is I'm not theologically educated. You know? You know? So what theology I have is all as a result of my, the insight I believe God gave me in the original revelations and my 20 years of reflection upon it, um, rather than, because women were not allowed to go to university in the state of either, as you know. So I think the chances of her having read Anselm or read other theology was pretty low, if not non existent. That's my personal view. Yeah. Hi. In addition to a number of um, comments of thanks for what you've, what you've said, uh, a couple of questions, if I may, from our, our audience online. The first one is. Um, just asking about the idea of the um, of sinfulness actually giving us a more profound indwelling of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. that sort of uptipping of um, mm -hmm. perhaps the more common way of doing it. Is this a specifically Mother Julian revelation innovation? Is what you're asking. Oh right. Um, personally, I, I'm not. I, I'm not a total expert on these things. Uh, my my instinct would be that it is fairly unique to her. Um, you know, when she talks about sin as behovely, um, meaning it was appropriate or it was, you know, apposite or it was jolly useful, uh, is one way of translating behovely. Um, but the way she sees that is because uh, she'd received a, a kind of the spiritual insight, the revelation, 
uh, that um, it was, it's through what we experience as uh, the pain of sinfulness that God is able to show us even more love rather than judgment. So her big message is, you know, all of this is, di is directed towards the revelation of God's love to us. And that God not only shows love, but God is love. You know, the, the final you know, chapter of the long text is a famous, um, if I can find it quickly. Um, uh, yeah, chapter 86. Um, uh, and from the time that it was revealed, she says, I desired many times to know in what was our Lord's meaning, what was God's meaning. And 15 years after and more, I was answered in my spiritual understanding. And it was said, what? Do you wish to know your Lord's meaning in this thing? Know it well. Love was his meaning. Who reveals it to you? Love. What did he reveal to you? Love. Why does he reveal it to you? For love. Remain in this and you will know more of the same, but you will never know different without end. Thank you. There's a, another uh, suggestion. I don't know um, how you respond to the thought that the power dynamics between Lord and servant um, could have been shaped by the Black Death and all that happened to the economy and oh, yeah, yeah. everything at that yes, time. Does yes. that ring true for you? Um, yes, it does. I mean, I think that I, I think I mentioned that briefly um, that um, <clears throat> the whole relationship between lords and servants was when Julian was around was in the middle of the major shifts. And that would have been one of the reasons why the shifts were taking place. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, another thing was the growth of cities. Um, I acknowledge, you know, that they were becoming much more important uh, and that um, previously uh, the dominant economic and social and cultural uh, forces were rural in the sense that that's where most of the nobility lived, in castles in the country, as it were. Um, uh, Whereas things were beginning to shift around. So, yes, I think that's part of the reason. Uh, the other is a, is a sort of cultural material shift away from a kind of very rural based uh, kind of way in which we thought of society or what they thought of society towards a more urban, more city based, in which the dominant group was actually moving away from being the aristocracy to being the new merchant class, who incidentally were the first groups to educate their daughters. Last one from online. Um, I'm just going to read it as it is. Oh. How significant does Julian see Mary's role, the ditch of the virgin's womb, Adam's fairest daughter? Hmm. Is the idea of her being co-redemptrix Julian idea or a later idea? It's a later idea. <clears throat> I mean, I think, um, no, I mean, uh, you know, Julian does have some things to say about Mary the Virgin Mary, but it, it's not a it's not a big, not a massive theme in, in Julian. Um, I mean, she does see uh, you know the uh, God's incarnation, uh, you know, into the womb of the Virgin Mary uh, as being a kind of balance to Adam's fall uh, uh, at uh, you know the, the Book of Genesis. You know, um, but um, no, I don't think. I wouldn't have personally, I hadn't thought of that, but I wouldn't personally have thought that co-redemptrix was one of her, probably her big deals. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. I was doing the online ones. Is there any more from here before we finish? One last one? No, I think not. Well, thank you, Philip. For me, slightly contrary to Debbie's earlier question, um, I found it really helpful um, in, in kind of great pleasure of the insight of it's with pity, not with blame. I've often got a tiny bit queasy about sin being sloughed off rather quickly because uh, it's okay, it's with pity, not with blame. And for me, you've, um, by doing your visual thing of not in a uh, longitudinal plan, but if the whole plan, Yes, the, all that is uh, um, taught by Holy Church, the entire plan, still there, but squashed into a single moment. Nothing is lost in the um, longitudinal, of the longitudinal version of things, nothing is lost. 
it's just conflated into one for me. And that is a, a little personal foible that yes, you've, yes. you've assisted me with, that um, it's not that she diminishes sin in any way. Mm -hmm. She just transforms the temporal method yes. to which we to which we see. So that's that's my thanks. But I know for all of us, and particularly from what I've seen in the comments online, a lot of real warm appreciation oh, for you yeah. opening up this lovely, tender part of her writing for us in a really clear, clear way. Those two ways of seeing. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks. For Well, folks, there are refreshments upstairs, um, in, upstairs, up the hill uh, at the Julian Centre, and I'm sure Philip might be, uh, oh, yes. be up there and has a bun, so oh, cat with you. I might have another coffee. I needed another coffee. <laughs> and I gather there's maybe a glass of candy. A um, glass of something cold, I'm not sure, person what it is. No, no, but, but we can't, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's get all this together. <laughs> Thank you.